do we think that applicants who attended an R1 school for undergrad are at a disadvantage for faculty positions? And I believe the consensus in the chat among the panelists was that no, um, that's not going to be a disadvantage. Um, and I think enthusiasm and interest in working with undergraduates, both in teaching and research, will trump what institutions your academic journey has sort of taken you through. I'm, I've, I've sat on several search committees and I've never been in a search committee where we said, this person has no previous experience at a PUI, therefore they would not be effective as a faculty member at a PUI. The next question that I would like to jump into, um, and I'll, I'll throw this to, to Dr. Stitzel, what do you think are some keys to successful teaching at a PUI? Um, so are you talking about actually teaching a lecture in front of my students? Or are you talking about managing how to teach? Because I would say teaching in and of itself shouldn't be distinguished between PUI and R1. I would hope that if you're teaching your students, you're you're engaging with them and trying to to cover what's important. Um, but so I wasn't quite sure where you were going with that question. Just want to make sure I'm answering the right one. Yeah, I think I think it would be entirely fine to take it in the direction of sort of from the the planning stage of the teacher, like in preparing for teaching success and, and that type of thing. Go ahead and head in that direction if you don't mind, Dr. Sitzel. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I've had opportunities to do that I'm not sure I would have had time or uh, encouragement to do at NR1 um, is to actually spend some time doing professional development in the space around teaching. Um, and that really has helped me over the years become a better teacher, I think. So I've had opportunities to work with something like um, the Council on Undergraduate Research, which also has space for teaching despite its name. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so there's a lot of good discussions um, that you can have with colleagues from other institutions about their perspectives, things that work, things that don't work, um, learning how to find your own voice. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's taken me a long time to find. And I've had to spend some time doing some of these professional development learning opportunities, either on my campus or through these other um, organizations. Um, American Chemical Society has some uh, good materials around how to teach and ways to interact with other people to learn about teaching um, and, and see teaching. I'm a very much, um, I like to see things to understand how to how to do it well. Sometimes when I just read an article, I'm like, oh, that sounds really interesting. I have no idea how to do that. <laughs> I need to talk to somebody who's done it or watch someone in action and get that. So I think anytime you have an opportunity to go in and watch a colleague who's known to be a good teacher to see how they teach, that's a brilliant way to do it. Or go to a workshop that allows you to, um, I got an opportunity to be videoed prior to this whole being online where I'm constantly now videoed, but used to be I never saw myself teach, right? I got up there, I did something, have no idea what happened. Later, somebody would be like, well, you said this. I'm like, I did? How could I have possibly said that? That's crazy. Like, <laughs> um, but now that um, we have these opportunities to be recorded, that's another great way to understand your teaching, your persona, how you're coming across to your students. And so just constantly being um, open to resources that become available about how to teach, different ways to teach. Even occasionally the publishers will come to you with materials that are new and different that you're like, eh, I didn't learn that way. Maybe that's not where I want to go, but sometimes they're actually useful. You know, clickers weren't a thing when I was an undergrad. I use them all the time now, you know, so it's, it's just kind of being open, I think, to the different pieces and opportunities that come up as you're teaching, I think is important to, um, being successful as a teacher, being willing to adapt. So. Thank you very much. Dr. Bolin, um, would you like to add your thoughts on, on ways that you've uh, found to be helpful as you prepared over your career for teaching success? Yeah, so um, I think where everybody is right now, which uh, many of you are not yet, in a PUI position uh, would be to get experience teaching. I think that's the best way uh, to learn is, is um, to get experience and start to be curious about what pedagogy is. And, and to the degree which you can talk about the things you've tried and um, the things that have worked in your applications, it will help you get the position. I, I, you know, those teaching statements are important when you apply, uh, if you apply. Um, so as specific as you can be and the more you can talk about your own experience, the better. Um, so 
right now, find opportunities to be involved in teaching. Um, my own experience was pretty different than most faculty, I think, is just I taught high school for three years. I was chair of the science department, <laughs> you know. I, I did lots of things which most people don't get the opportunity to do. Um, I was also part of Teacher America where professional development self-reflection was baked in um, to what I did. And so uh, anyway, so so that's if it's the extent you can do those sorts of things now, I would encourage it. Um, and then clearly, once you get to an institution or if you get the opportunity to have a visiting position, I would say for a PUI where your teaching is going to be your primary, not only primary responsibility, having teaching experience through a visiting position is not a detriment. It is a positive. Um, so I think the advice I got from my R run one um, advisors was don't do a visiting position. That's a trap. Um, it can be for some people, but if your goal is to end up in a PUI, then it actually can be beneficial. And it was for me as well. Um, uh, I mean, because at a PUI, you are interested in teaching. Like that is, that is something you are responsible for. It is one of the three legs and it is the, probably the most important one. Um, you will have opportunities. Uh, people will be critiquing you. You will have the opportunity to critique others. You will have the opportunity to observe as um, Dr. Stitzel had said. So um, take advantage of those. Um, be self-curious, be willing to like watch yourself on video. That's so hard. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, Dr. Bolin. And on that uh, note of, of peer observation and having other people, other experienced instructors give you feedback, um, your institution, if you're in a tenure track position, as, as Dr. Bolin mentioned, you will be uh, evaluated, especially if you're working at a PUI. Um, but that doesn't preclude you from inviting people to observe your teaching in an informal sort of you know, uh, unofficial uh, way and get that informal feedback. And one of the other things that I'll just recommend is that not all peer observations are created equal. So you really should seek out feedback from people who you know and respect as high quality teachers who have a reputation on campus for being really good at, cl as, at classroom instruction and getting that critical feedback. Because if, if I'm being frank, sometimes peer observations, depending on who might be assigned to do your sort of observation in support of your tenure dossier might not be giving you the critical feedback that's going to benefit you as much. And so really seeking out those people who are going to tell you the truth and say, these are the things you're doing well, these are the things you can improve upon uh, can be really helpful, I think. Um, and one of the things that I'm going to post in the chat is a, is a book that I discovered when I was a graduate student that's now in a, a later edition called Teaching at Its Best. That's a, a research-based guide for college instructors. It's specific to the teaching that happens at the university and the college level that I commend to you uh, uh, by uh, Linda Nielsen from Clemson University. Um, so if you haven't checked that out, I, I have no conflict of interest other than the fact that my master's degree is from Clemson, but I, I don't get any uh, uh, influencer kickbacks from, from that. Um, Dr. Ball, uh, did you want to uh, jump in at this point, if you would, please, on, on keys to success for preparing for teaching excellence? Yeah, so... Um... I may have a slightly different tap than the other two speakers in that um, from the perspective of identity and what it takes for you when, you're, when your CV comes across, you know, a search committee's um, table, uh, depending on where you're applying to different things are going to stand out. And this is just from my experience of being on some faculty searches. So for me, I did not have any teaching um, experience in graduate school and that was solely because I was able to have um, a fellowship and all the other business so I, I was never a TA however I did mentor a lot of students coming through the graduate lab and as a matter of fact mentoring especially in a research lab is a form of teaching so if you're able to get that type of experience and be able to that is a form of communicating something that's complex training a student and actually getting something out of that student is actually critically important as well. And I, I do wanna also point out that particularly for me, my experience of being a queer person of color 
in the in a in a school in graduate school where there are a lot of me there, um, I did not have the luxury to take my eye off of research research productivity because that I, I had to have so many papers before I graduated. It was a lot to navigate dynamics in a laboratory <laughs> situation. <laughs> so it was enough for me my inter, the interpersonal skills that I developed to be able to talk to people and be able to collaborate and whatever actually was a strength. And actually that's a strength that you will need because you need that empathy and experience and being able to work through those things in order to be a, a good teacher as well. So I, I, I really wanna be careful about, um, I, I just wanna provide a different uh, perspective in other things you can do to help you um, be attractive for a job and also help you be successful once you, um, start to teach and i'm going to be quite frank with you if you're going to apply at a pui that has a research component to it and then it's very clear they expect you to have a research program a robust one it is going to be whether you know a criteria for excellent application i've seen it so many times is do you have first off publications how many publications you have where are they where are they in and so i don't want to devalue um that perspective and and you know and we can have conversations offline about how to navigate those different things because I don't want to put the pressure that it has to happen in graduate school right that's the reason why you have postdocs right um, but I do want to also just point out there's reasons why you may not have a lot of comprehensive teaching experience coming into the job market and um, while it is a definitely a plus if you're a business assistant professor or if you've had these type of teaching things um, I think going to workshops about teaching going to diversity inclusion type of workshops those are just as important and I would say as valued for a faculty search and also for your teaching as being able to teach in a class and let's be honest we don't get great training <laughs> in graduate school when it, when it comes to teaching and the only other thing i would just kind of end on with what i have to say is that um if you think of your teaching trajectory it's just to get you through tenure you're just gonna you're just not gonna be it, once you get tenure it's, it's just not gonna be in your blood anymore teaching is just what a professor stitzel said is adaptability every single time you teach a course you get a different group of students and so you have to be very, pandemics happen, online learning happens. So you have to be very, very quick on your feet. And um, teaching is a lifelong journey. So I don't expect excellence in every single thing that I, by the time I come for tenure, I was being very frank. There's some things I have to improve on as I become full professor, right? Um, and it should be things that you can improve on. If you're absolute perfection, by time you are a tenure professor, you're gonna become one of those colleagues who are, are very difficult to deal with because no one can tell you anything different. No student, student comes to you and tell you something, be like, oh, no, 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 I've been teaching this for X amount of years. There's nothing that you can possibly tell you. <laughs> you're gonna come for a rude awakening. So I would think of teaching as a really long-term trajectory. You always wanna be improving, always want to be innovating, and it should excite you, do what kind of excites you. So, yeah. Thank you very much for that helpful perspective, Dr. Ball. I appreciate that a great deal. Um, one of the uh, chat questions that came up that I think is is important to address from Walla asked about, are there differences in salary between faculty members at PUIs and faculty members at R1s? In a word, yes. Um, and and the, the there's good data from CNE News, for example, that supports the fact that if you're working at a PUI, your base salary is likely to be less than if you're working at an R1. How big of a gap that is can vary from place to place, um, both geographically in terms of cost of living, but also from one type of PUI to another. Um, but if, if having a high salary in academia is high in your list, a PUI might not be for you um, because I, I've not encountered a colleague that said, oh, I, I wanted to work as a professor at a PUI because they make so much money. Um, hashtag not true. Uh, but I invite the, the panelists to sort of fact check my own assessment um, on, on that. Uh, Dr. Boland, is, is that, does that strike you as reasonable? Yeah, I, I mean, to be honest, I think of it, uh, the people who I work with have chosen this profession not because of the high pay. 
but because of what that's what they want to do. And I actually see that as an advantage. Uh, the people I, I work with want to be here to do the job that we're doing together. Uh, and I think that actually contributes to the quality of the, the work experience that I have from my colleagues. Um, I will say that many institutions have pretty good benefits though. Um, so uh, that's, the, that's something you should be inquisitive about, whether it's sabbatical, generous sabbatical programs, which exist. Uh, my institution currently has one, we'll see how long that lasts. Um, and, uh, but also like tuition remission for, for family. Um, and those are things you should be curious about. Dr. Butler, Dr. Stitzel, did you wanna contribute your, your insights on, on any of that so far? Um, I'll just point out if you happen to be at a PUI that's also a state controlled institution, you might want to pay attention to how the local uh, government is interested in funding or not funding your particular institution in any given academic cycle. Um, things like cost of living adjustments can get frozen for a really long time, depending on the economy when you're at a state institution. Not that it can't happen at private institutions as well, but just another little piece of the puzzle to think about. I did go from private to public and went, oh, wait, what's, th what's this now? <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Dr. I, Dr. Ball, yeah, please go ahead. And I saw, Dr. Ball, that you posted some helpful links to be able to do salary comparisons from, I believe that was Chronicle of Higher Ed uh, links. Right. Yeah, those are kind of self-reported. Sometimes they can get it from data from other places. Uh, here's, a, here's a rule of thumb. Look at the endowment of the school. That's going to be your that's going to be a pretty good barometer of what your salary is going to be. I'll, I'll, I'll just be, so for example, if the endowment of your, of your private institution is above probably $600 million, right? You can expect, depending on cost of living, somewhere between 70s and upper 80s when it comes to your starting salary. If you're starting off at uh, a comprehensive public university, it, it may be lower, but then also your responsibilities for, I mean, it, it, things are a little bit different, right? So for example, if you decide to be a part of a Cal, of a Cal State Los Angeles or Cal Poly um, University, for example, those Cal State, you are a unionized faculty member. So it's very clear what tenure needs to be. It's very clear what the salary structures are going to be. And that's a way more navigable situation than at Pomona College where it's a black box <laughs> where salaries are. Tenure can be a little nebulous. So um, there's, there's pluses and minuses to it, right? And so this idea of being unionized is an interesting thing. Um, the I and that has benefits in regards to leaves and things. so it depends on where you want to live. It depends on um, these extra benefits that you have. Sabbaticals are amazing, right? Being able to send your kid have a tu tuition remission program is great. Um, there's a, having housing assistance is wonderful. So those things can help you calculate. Um, and if you really want to get adult, your retirement. <laughs> so I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of how much you got to pay for health insurance. So there's actually a lot of detail that you need to kind of think about in regard to, oh, they're going to offer you $75,000, but you're living in Iowa and they're helping you with your, I mean, they live in Iowa and they're helping you with your, um, your housing situation. And there's a generous sabbatical thing and they have a child care thing. I mean, that's, that's worth, that's priceless. So I think you, we have been trained, particularly in the US to really think about salary as your only way for wealth accruement. But having a heavily discounted housing is a way to accrue wealth and to be able to help your family get out of a situation, help you get out of a situation. So I, I we can talk about this afterwards, but I, I think there's a lot more to consider than just the uh, sticker value. Thank you, Dr. Ball, for those insights. And can I, can I make two more points, quick, quick points? Please, Nate, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so, so also some R1 um, salaries are, are partially soft, which if you don't know what that means, it means that you don't get that money unless you have a grant that pays that part of your salary. 
So it's important to recognize that um, I don't know of a, a PUI position which is soft, right? It's it's hard money. You, but you, that's what your salary is, starting salary is going to be. Um, the, the second point I want to make is more um, not meant to entirely scare you, but there's something called the uh, demographic cliff. <laughs> uh, was kids who were born around the time of the last recession. There's many fewer of them. There are fewer high school graduates expected in 2026. And um, more and more PUIs in particular that rely on those undergraduate students are going to be under financial strain. Um, so uh, you should be aware of that and you should be inquisitive if you're applying to a place how they're doing. Um, get the honest opinion, <laughs> um, not what their face, their website says. Um, and the endowment is a good indicator of how successful they might be in riding out that, this uh, current crisis. I'm sorry, can you just um, explain the beginning part of what you said again? You said that if they were born near a time of like the most recent recession? Yeah. Yeah, so if, if, if you go back to 2008, 2026 is 18 years after that. So those are, in that year, fewer people decided to have children because of the financial strain they were in. And in the U.S., there will be 15% fewer high school graduates, which means 15% fewer students seeking undergraduate education. There's also a bit of a political shift where the value of an undergraduate education, the cost-benefit analysis has changed and fewer students are deciding to front that money. Um, so um, there, there is, if you start looking for it, you'll find lots of articles. <laughs> explaining it. And um, there's some people have even done financial analyses of institutions to say whether or not they're at risk. All really important points. And I think one of the questions that you can ask folks at institutions is a question related to um, economic resilience. Can, can, you know, can, can someone who knows something about the, the inner workings of that, that institution tell you from experience how resilient the finances are at that particular institution? And as was pointed out, think looking at endowments for private institutions, um, looking at the economic or the budgetary health of a state that a public institution might fall in can all be really, really important. Uh, Next, I want to talk about what ends up being sort of a practical question that has ramifications for teaching at, at all institutions, but I think particularly PUIs, which would be time management, um, where we have to sort of balance th that academic triad in a way that at many PUIs puts increased emphasis on teaching. And Dr. Stitzel, I, I guess I'll invite you to, to talk about what does time management look like in your day-to-day -day or your week when there, we're in the middle of a semester and maybe and just for some maybe some additional context and this hasn't come up yet but um, this idea of having teaching assistants looks very different at many PUIs compared to R1 institutions and so at least at Towson and Dr. Stitzel you feel free to elaborate on this um, we have very few teaching assistants where as as tenure tenure track faculty we are responsible for the vast majority majority of the lab instruction that goes with our lecture courses and we're responsible for the vast majority if not all of the grading that goes in with that and I know that that can sort of vary a little bit from institution to institution but much more so than at an R1 at a PUI you should plan on being sort of the whole show when it comes to the teaching process. Dr. Stitzel I'll pass it to you. Yeah, and that and that that whole show also just for the time management piece. Also, we tend to have fewer resources for instrument maintenance and everything. So you're the whole show across the spectrum, and that can really play into your time management in any given week, depending on what's going on. Um, so my typical week when we're in the mid semester, I've got you know lectures in the morning, labs in the afternoon. Um, I try to keep my schedule so that it's at most three days a week that I'm actually um, front facing with students. So that doesn't include office hours, which are typically scheduled outside of class time. Um, although things are different in a virtual world. Things, <laughs> things have been a little more fluid. Um, so, but I would typically have um, about three hours of office hours scheduled a week that are open door um, in addition to my lectures and lab time um, teaching analytical chemistry lab my labs always run the full time i almost never get out early <laughs> and and i'm usually doing some prep ahead and then shut down of instruments and whatnot after so lab is you know an hour longer for me than my students typically um, i 
and then trying to do lecture preparation. So I think this there's an ebb and flow to the the tenure um, or not to the tenure the teaching process. You know, my first year teaching, I spent way too many hours over preparing for class because I lived in fear that someone would ask me a question I didn't know the answer to. You can't forestall that. So just give it up before you go in and you can save yourself some some heartache and some time. Um, <laughs> but you still have to prepare. And even when you've been teaching a class now for 10 years, I still spend time going through lecture notes and kind of going through the handwritten notes that I've added each semester going, oh, right, this was a lecture where everything imploded and like they did not get this concept. And so I need to rethink how this is going to work or, oh, yeah, this one actually went OK. I don't need to really spend too, too much time rejiggering, you know, so it, it varies as you get more experience, you have more to fall back on. But but I personally am not in a position where I ever feel comfortable just walking into lecture cold and hoping that it all goes well. I've done it exactly once and it was not my best day. <laughs> so, um, you know, so I always spend at least uh, 15 minutes ahead of class and usually longer going over things, kind of getting mentally prepared, set to go into the classroom. And then again, when I come back, assuming I haven't gotten way late in the hallway by five people between the classroom and my office, I'm coming back and writing down notes about what have I learned? What do I want to do differently? What questions came up during class that I want to go back and readdress the next time? You know, those kinds of things that are constantly happening. So, and then then there's the research piece, which comes in, you know, and gets layered in on top of whatever my teaching responsibilities are. And then there's that third leg, service, which again, depending on where you are in your career, can be um, very light. We try to protect our junior faculty members and not give them too, too much of a service load. Um, and then once you're tenured, service can go through the roof if you let it. <laughs> <laughs> a word you need to learn early and often is, no, I can't do that right now. I'm really bad at that. So um, occasionally my service loads have um, overtaken things. I will say, though, at a PUI, um, I think um, Dr. Ball spoke to this earlier, you are invested in your institution. And so sometimes you can pick service opportunities that you really feel strongly about and you actually feel like are supporting the overall institutional goals or your personal goals for your education career. Um, and so there can be a lot of benefit from some of those service opportunities. And then there are the ones that are just pure and utter time sucks and you just got to get through those as best you can. <laughs> so and then occasionally I like to talk to my family, you know, then and the positive of the pandemic for me is I don't have a commute so the commute went away um, that would be something I would think about when you're talking about the benefits of an institution and where you can afford to live relative to where you have to work if you have a commute how long is that commute how much is that commute going to cost you because <laughs> um, that that's actually something that plays into the overall um, benefits of the salary and everything else just as an aside there so I'll Great. stop there. Thank you, Dr. Stitzel. Um, and I'll just bounce next to Dr. Ball. When I think about time management, Dr. Ball, I, I routinely, even though I've been doing this for about nine years now, I routinely underestimate how long each and every task on my Outlook calendar is going to take. And I don't know if your experience has been similar or not, but, but what, maybe share with us your insights in terms of time management and what that looks like for you. Uh, 100%. <laughs> it's uh, it's always um, a tremendous. So um, time management. So I, there's one thing I want to um, this attention. I think it's really important, and I think Dr. Stitzel kind of got to this um, when it comes to our visible identities and in your workplace, how people can um, systemically take advantage of that. Is really interesting. So for example, it's well documented that for women and for faculty of color, that um, you're, often, you're often asked to do a lot. And then we have been socially conditioned not to say no. Because if I'm, if I'm saying no, I'm gonna be considered this. If I say no, I'm gonna be considered that. Which in reality, the twisted thing is, people actually respect it when you say no, which is weird, <laughs> right? And it's a very, we can talk about that later, but it's, it's a weird kind of dynamic. And so um, when it comes to time management, I just, it, it requires me to be very honest about what I can do and what I can't do. I know for me, what I've learned is that I can do 
um, fewer yeah. things in depth very well. So over committing myself, I'm just not going to do super well. I also understand there's certain things I really enjoy. So for example, I want to be a part of a committee that is going to have impact on the college. I'm not super interested in a committee that doesn't. So I will do that. I am really, I really like thinking about how can we have more fair and unbiased faculty searches or staff searches. So I volunteer for a search a semester, right? Because that's something that I like because I want to really have an influence what making sure that when we have colleagues that we really did our due justice. Um, when it comes to teaching, it gets better, right? So you, you will get to a point where you can say, okay, 15 minutes, I got my notes, I looked over it. Okay, I have a really good sense about how this wants to be. As long as I have my structure together for how I want for my class, I can do really well. Now, at living it doesn't work. Jumping out of bed and coming on to Zoom and doing your class does not work. It is a performance. And so whatever you need to do in order to energize yourself and for you to feel comfortable talking about something, um, it's great. And the more times you teach it, the better you will get. So, um, that's how I do that. Um, I've been really, um, when you are a junior faculty member, you can say no, that's, oh, you know, oh, I gotta get started on stuff. I gotta say no. I'm going to take that energy into my associate professor years and say, hey, I, I just can't do it, right? So I had to actually recently, for example, I was a part of a faculty group that had well intentions of doing something, but it was really sapping a lot of energy from me. And so basically I said, nope, I can't do this. Like you all, what you're trying to do and what the resources for you have to do are not matching. And so therefore it's costing me a lot more energy to be a part of this group versus what I can get out of it. So I'm just going to buy out. And, and that's totally fine. And actually people would respect you to do that. Then um, you're doing a whole bunch of things and getting, getting kind of stressed out. Um, I will say that um, I have a different view of my teaching than some of my colleagues have been. I'm very, very selfish of my time because I know that whatever I bring into my classroom, I'm giving 100%, not 110. We all know this mathematically, you can't do that, but I'm giving like 100% of, of my effort. So if I tell us, so I tell students, these are times I can meet, we have a Calendly thing, they can come up with, you know, a reservation. I don't have an open door policy because I know if my door was open all the time, I would never get anything done. And actually what I've found is when you tell students why you don't have an open door policy, they completely respect it. And then they actually appreciate the time that you give them a lot more. So, um, but we've been conditioned to think of, we work at a small college, we have to have an open door policy, it's great. But for certain people, certain demographics, um, because society is telling you that, oh, if you're a woman, then you're going to be motherly and you're going to do this. If you are a, uh, a person of color, then you're going to have all these <laughs> different students kind of come to you. Um, you have a job. And when you want to disengage from your job, you owe it to yourself to be able to do that and owe it, owe it to yourself to say no, including your students. And they will actually respect you and appreciate you more. Uh, it may be a rough transition, but they, in the long run, they would respect you because they, they need a model for how to say no. They need a model for saying, nope, this is my time. I will work with you to try to find a time for you, but I just can't do it now. And um, they respect that. I have found. Dr. Ball, yeah, thank you very much for that. It's really important uh, that, that it sort of informs our work-life balance. And one of the things that I've observed is that it can be helpful, especially if you're teaching lower division courses, to explain to students what it is to be a professor, to help them know, because a lot of students, they're bringing a high school mindset, and they might mistake your job as a professor for that of a teacher in a K-12 type setting and not recognize the different responsibilities that a professor has compared to a teacher. And I, I, I have a tremendous amount of respect for K-12 teachers. The only reason why I'm here is because I had a phenomenal chemistry teacher in high school who told me, John, don't teach at high school. And then she had a long list of reasons why she didn't want me to teach at high school. That's for another day. But I think helping students to realize the different uh, responsibilities that we have as professors can help inform to Dr. Ball's point about having those boundaries uh, on our time. Um, 
And speaking of time, I want to open up the floor to open Q&A at this point because I do like to make sure that we can finish on time. And so we have in the 25 minutes that remain, I just want to invite any of the participants today to either use the raised hand uh, feature at this point to bounce questions off. If you're more comfortable using the chat, please feel free to do that. But have any questions come to mind that, that anyone would like to raise to the panel? And I see as I'm catching up in the chat, um, I, one of the questions has to do with um, are postdocs necessary in order to apply to a PUI? I'm going to intentionally punt on that question because this Friday we're going to talk about application strategies for faculty positions at a PUI. Um, so hopefully you can come back and we'll talk about that. Um, the one word answer would be no, not required to have a postdoc to apply to a PUI, but probably helpful. So that's sort of the quick synopsis um, there. Um, one of the other questions that came in on the chat was how much is industry government experience valued when applying for a position at a PUI? Um, Dr. Boland, would you mind taking that question about the role of industry government experience when applying to PUIs? I can, I can speak from my experience uh, at the University of Puget Sound in Whitman College um, to uh, liberal arts PUIs, uh, small liberal arts PUIs. Um, and I will say, I'm not necessarily sure that it, it would it would count a lot. Uh, it, uh, I think um, it could, if, if you make a case that it will inform your teaching and your research well. I think that's, that's the, the, the caveat there. Um, with regards to ageism, you know, I think there, uh, I have heard on some of the panels I've said on some concern for, for people who appear to be just jumping ship in a career um, and looking for anything um, that will, will get them somewhere different. Not to say that we haven't had, uh, we, in these same panels, we have give great um, consideration for folks who are in those positions um, and even had on-campus interviews with some of them. So, uh, but I think uh, I have heard that ageist sort of um, expression uh, concern. So. And Dr. Ball, did you want to speak to that as well, if you would, from your experience on, at, at Pomona? Um, I would say that um, Dr. Boland pretty much kind of summarized what my experience would be as well. I, I would say that um, in regard to industrial and government experience, that couldn't be be quite a positive if you spin it pretty well in regards to your research. Um, you just can be, you just need to put in your cover letter, you need to put in your research statement, just be very, very explicit about how that experience can be actually beneficial. Almost every department could probably use that, <laughs> that expertise, um, but sometimes they don't know it unless you tell them. So just put it in multiple places in your, in your application. In regards to um, ageism, different pathway, the pathway part, I definitely agree with Dr. Bowen. I've seen instances where people may have posed questions about what was happening. Um, your application is your biggest way to just address all those issues proactively. So just say in your cover letter where you started, why you want to be a part of you, what have you done to prepare yourself for being in that position? And that kind of erases a lot of questions folks may have. Great, thank you very much for that. Um, one of the things that, uh, I, I know we have about 50% of our participants today are in engineering departments. And um, just speaking a little bit from my history as sort of dabbling in both the engineering world and the chemistry world by means of background. And I, I don't think I, I told you my academic journey. So I guess better, better late than never. My uh, undergraduate degree is in chemistry from Central Michigan University. And then my master's degree is in environmental engineering from Clemson University. And my PhD is in environmental engineering from Johns Hopkins University. And then I went on to do a postdoc in chemical and environmental engineering at Yale. What that ended up doing though for my job search was sort of uh, complicating because historically, in order to be viewed as a quote, real chemist, your PhD had to be in chemistry. And at the same time, historically, in order to be viewed from an academic standpoint as a real engineer, your undergraduate degree had to be in engineering. And I was exactly the opposite. My undergraduate degree was in chemistry. My graduate degrees were in environmental engineering. And so I was sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, out, 
out to sea without a harbor to be able to uh, uh, turn a phrase. But thankfully, I, I got some good mentoring from my PhD advisor and others in, in graduate school who helped me to Dr. Ball's point to craft my cover letters in such a way as to make the case that the hat that I wanted to wear, whether it was the chemistry hat today or the environmental engineering hat tomorrow, um, I had the experiences and the, and the publications and this type of thing to be able to make that case. And so that's a long way of saying, don't let the label of your academic department define you. You can be interested and, and, and gain experience in, in whatever it is that's in front of you. And your cover letter um, is, is a great way to sort of make that point, which is a free preview for Friday when we talk about success, uh, successful tips for uh, applications for faculty positions at PUIs. Are there other questions uh, that have come up? I'm sort of checking uh, on the chat here, um, but is there anyone who'd like to, to raise a hand and ask a question verbally that's come up while I review the chat? Uh, Sophia, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for this, by the way. This is a really great panel, a lot of really good information. Um, when it comes to teaching a new course, I know, so some practicals that I've heard about teaching new courses would be things like get notes from faculty who have taught it before um, or Actually, yeah, I guess that's maybe what I've heard. <laughs> so do you guys have any other advice for uh, new faculty who'd be teaching a course that they haven't even taken themselves and how to go about it? So like, would it be a thing of um, like, you're, you're learning it the day before and teaching it to them the next day or how would you try to prepare yourself for that? Maybe Dr. Stitzel, can you, can you start uh, on, on that question? That's a great question. Thank that you. That is a great question. I'm not sure I have a great answer. Um, there, hopefully you're not teaching it to yourself the night before, but it has happened. We'll just put it out there and, you know, no shame in just surviving, um, <laughs> especially in your first year. I always tell new faculty members, the first year is about survival. The second year we'll do a little refinement <laughs> and, because it's a lot when you start teaching something. If you've never taught it before, I, I hope for all of your sakes that it's something you've at least experienced in your um, background. I, my first teaching um, ex class, my first classes were all things I had taken previously. So it's, I'm hoping they wouldn't start you off in that deep end, <laughs> um, but I can't rule it out. Um, Getting notes from other faculty members if uh, if the course actually existed. Occasionally, we're, we're designing new courses, things that have never really been taught at our institution before. And you may or may not even have a textbook, right? So there, you may just be cobbling together from the literature and your own experience. That hopefully, it's at least something you are interested in um, and not being just told to teach. Uh, but so like I did a food chemistry class here because it was something I was interested in doing as an elective. Um, but there was a huge amount of time. I mean, if you're if it, you're teaching it for the first time, you've got to budget a whole lot more prep time um, into your schedule. And it's, I always try to make it, you know, the semester ahead. The reality is it somehow oozes into the current semester when I'm teaching it. And so I'm trying to stay a little bit ahead. But yeah, there have been moments where it's really close and that's okay because the other thing you've got to remember is that as long as you're putting together material that's informative, interesting, that you're being open with your students, um, taking questions, um, especially if you're teaching something for the first time, take those questions and then parlay them into the next lecture section of, hey, they wanted to know more about this, let's go that way. If it's not something that's, you know, as cut and dry as first semester general chemistry, where we really don't have a lot of latitude of how <laughs> going off in different directions, give yourself that flexibility to kind of say, hey, we're going to explore this together. And sometimes that actually ends up being a really fun way to do it, a little bit less stressful, um, and, and, and you survive it. I don't know, that my two cents. All great advice. Thank you very much, Dr. Stitzel. And I'll just uh, tackle one of the questions that came in in the chat. What opportunities have you seen for at PUIs for professor of the practice position? Um, um, some institutions will call that clinical faculty. Sometimes they'll be called um, teaching faculty um, that, that typically don't have a research component or don't have a, a, an extensive research expectation with those positions. I would say that they are increasingly common, especially in engineering departments, because the a lot of engineering departments are realizing that professor of practice or clinical faculty are really well positioned to teach courses like senior design and senior capstone experiences. 
Um, so th th that's something that I'm seeing uh, increase in engineering departments and to a certain extent, I think in um, the physical and the life sciences departments as well. A question that I would like to pose to Dr. Boland would be, aside from self-evaluation and teaching evaluations from students, which I like to refer to as uh, student satisfaction surveys, are there other formal measures that PUIs used for evaluating teaching? Yeah, um, so there are, I will say just, just this, is a, this is a debate, I would say within higher education is how do we get assessment of teaching which doesn't bear the biases, um, uh, implicit biases that students bring to the table. Um, and student evaluations are satisfaction surveys and all of their biases get brought into those and there's much conversation about that. Um, so uh, at my institution, um, while student evaluations are, a, are considered, um, your colleague evaluations are more important. And, and, and every place has a different structure of how tenure works. And um, so, so mine is, I think, a little bit different um, that um, we, we present our case for tenure, not before our department, not before even our div science division, but before a uh, cross-disciplinary panel. And in fact, the person who's responsible for, was responsible for reading my tenure all my letters and everything was purposely outside of the sciences. Um, they had a non-expert do that review. And so your colleague letters are, are merely there as support and evaluation in, in our context. Um, and so they're, they're the ones which, um, which give you that evaluation of your teaching. And, and we are required to be in person evaluating our peers. And so it's, it's based on direct observation. Um, uh, the, the last bit I'll say is that um, for us, and uh, hopefully this happens elsewhere, is we are given ample opportunity to explain our student evaluations and disagree with them um, and put them in context and allow our colleagues to do the same. Um, and so for us, the, the, the mantra is narrative, right? It is a narrative of your tenure case and your teaching. Um, and if you make a, a good case and you've demonstrated uh, awareness, and uh, curiosity about the concerns that students have, have um, as well as attempts to, to address those as well as you know, maybe your colleagues do, then, then you're pretty well, you're pretty fine. And just to build off of that that point, Dr. Boland, I, I just uh, in the middle of, of chairing my college's promotion and tenure committee. Uh, and one of the things that we look for are trends um, and when it comes to the student satisfaction, I mean, course evaluation surveys, we're also still looking for trends that if, if a, a lot of students, for example, are commenting on things like disorganization or not prepared, those are really bad, even, even though I sort of devalue the, 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 the metric that is the course evaluation. Those are things that students are actually, I think, qualified to speak to is, are you organized? Are you prepared for class? Other higher pedagogical things, I think it's a big ask to have a student assess teaching when they've never taken the course, let alone taught it. Um, but I think um, approaching those, as, as Dr. Boland, Boland pointed out, from sort of the perspective of responding to peer reviewer comments on a manuscript is a helpful way to think about it, where if you just completely dismiss trends in, in some of the feedback that you're getting and not provide that context and the things that you're, you're looking to do to ameliorate that, that's when promotion and tenure committees start to really dig in closely and say, what's going on here? And it's normally not to the benefit of the candidate to, to dismiss those out of hand. Um, speaking of hands, Moala, I see that you have a hand up. Would you please share with us what's on your mind? Yes, um, I was hoping that you all could talk a little bit about um, work-life balance in terms of having families. Um, I know a lot of my R1 professors have families and I've heard from their perspective, but I would love to hear from all of your perspectives as somebody who one day, you know, hopes to have children and stuff. Sure, sure. And I'll start. And then I'll, this is such an important question that I would like to invite all of the panelists to speak to. Um, so my household, I, I have a husband and two Labrador Retriever puppies um, that are uh, the, the delight of my life. But the, the both of my puppies and my husband have sort of on more than one occasion sort of watched as I came in late in the evening after dinner being like, what is it that was so important that you couldn't be home in time for dinner? And it was normally not a great 
answer. It was just, I got sort of caught up in something really interesting in research or teaching. Um, but I do try to um, set a schedule in terms of, I want to know what time I want to leave in the morning and what time I want to return home in the evening and sort of set those boundaries to not have things sort of bleeding into that home time and predetermine that and, and do a better job. I'm still learning how to do a better job of sort of enforcing those uh, times, both so that uh, my husband and I can sort of plan activities that might involve in the evening, even if it's just something as unexciting as, as scheduling a trip to Home Depot or, or, or something, you know, more important than that. Um, so yeah, that's sort of what it looks like in my household. And I'm still learning it, about how to do that better. It's the blessing and the curse of academia is unless I have a class or like a faculty meeting, I can be wherever I want doing whatever I want. And um, that can sort of uh, expand to take up more of one's life than it, it, it should if you're not careful, I think at times. Um, but Dr. Stitzel, let me pass this to you and, and, and you can speak to work-life balance. Um. Work-life balance is an evolving thing. We go for day-to-day -day in our house. Um, so I have a husband, a seven-year-old daughter. We got one of the COVID puppies in December. So now we've got what feels like a toddler running around the house eating everything and um, two cats. The cats are really really laid back. I, I vote for cats right now. Um, I love my family. Um, I will speak from the perspective of the child bearer in the sciences. For any of you who are um, female and want to have kids and haven't had them yet, I will alert you to one issue that I know I experienced as well as several of my um, friends and colleagues in the sciences. Uh, when you are trying to get pregnant and you have to get tenure, and the only way you can get tenure is working in a chemistry lab with chemicals that you're not supposed to be touching while trying to get pregnant, there are some serious logistics that go on to, in that work-life balance scenario. So you want to really think carefully about what you want to value, what's important to you, and feel good about the decisions that you're making. And that's not to say that there are right or wrong decisions, but it just needs to be true to where you are with your family in that moment and and just hold tight to, to what it is that's important to you. So I, that is something that you can struggle with. I would I would encourage you if you're struggling in that particular space, it's really important to have a good relationship with your department chairperson. Um, if it's not someone that you feel like you can speak to, maybe there's a dean in your college or someone that you can really kind of go to for support and uh, resources to, to figure that particular little piece out that is sort of unique to certain ones of us. So I'll just stop there. Thanks very much, Dr. Sissel. And most new faculty members, too, um, in many departments will be assigned a senior faculty or one or more senior faculties as a mentor. And they're also a great resource to, that, that should and can be advocating on your behalf um, as you're going through the tenure process. Dr. Ball, would you like to speak to work-life balance? Um, and then we'll go to Dr. Boland. And then, Jake, I also see that you have your hand up. So we're coming to you as well, Jake. Uh, yeah. Um, hmm. Uh, I, I think um, if you, if you, okay, so if I could do it all over again, this is kind of the biggest advice that I would receive. And I will tell you, it, it came from a colleague who I deeply respect at my college, who's just kicking on all cylinders. Um, for example, you, when you teach, students want to see a little bit of vulnerability from you, and you have a hesitation of doing that. Because a colleague said to me, I can't be vulnerable in front of my students when I haven't processed the trauma that it was to be in graduate school. And everyone in this room has this something in their PhD that is kind of like, oh my God, like this is really kind of, sh this was a tough time. But you don't have any time to process that. And so my biggest advice would be take this time now while you have health insurance. While there's a wellness of, while there is an awareness of mental health um, advocacy, to start therapy, start thinking about ways to kind of meditate and center yourself. And the reason why I say that is because you will gain clarity about what's really important for you. So, for example, if it's really important for you to have children, and that's what you really want to do, that's going to drive 
how you interview is going to drive what you're looking for in the school that you're applying for. Um, but a lot of times that so we're we just got off this roller coaster of a postdoc at graduate school, we have not given ourselves time to really think about what's important. So then when you get your job and then you have these epiphanies at random periods and you're like, oh crap, how do I now kind of readjust everything? And I, I um, so that's what I would say to you when it comes to work. If I was to do it all over again, I would say, oh, I have, you know, Kaiser, I have the University of Michigan Health Insurance. Let me make sure I take time to process what's going on with me so that when I start my job, I can be able to decouple my self-worth from my job. I am a chemist. I work at professor, I work at Pomona College. Thankfully, I have tenure, but that's not all that I am. And if I've learned very closely that if I tie my self-worth to papers, to my job, how well my teaching is every day, I, my mental health deteriorates. And you see this in your colleagues. You probably see it in your colleagues that you're working with now. When they closely align their self-worth to their job performance, it is a unattainable unsustainable thing. So when you hear some of us who's kind of be up in the future, right, where we say, oh, I wanted to be able to go to my kids' soccer match. I wanted to have kids. I want to do that. Um, the earlier you're able to kind of, if this kind of even bubbling, on a, as long as you start, be able to process that and be able to say, because I'm seeing my, my kids' soccer game or because I want to have a kid or because I want to have time by myself, not dealing with anyone else. Um, those are things that are, gonna, that are important for you. And they're things that make you a better colleague, make you a better teacher and better researcher. And so what I would say is that take time to figure out what energizes you and what you really need. And that will help you figure out how to prioritize your work-life balance. We're just in a system that doesn't allow us to do that. But we're at a time that if we take that, whether it's privately or publicly, if we take that time for ourselves, I'm telling you, it's going to be beneficial. So there was a time for me, probably 2000, in my, it was by my sabbatical, so it was 2018, where I said, oh, um, I'm really aligning a lot of my self-worth with my job. I'm a son. At that time, I was a partner in all this other business. Um, that's really conflicting with, with my life. I haven't, I'm not traveling because I feel I have to be here in the summer and do this type of work. And it isn't true. I can have a lot of flexibility with that. So I, I think um, whatever job you continue to do, that is not your identity. It's a part of your identity, but you have to figure out ways to decouple your self-worth from your job performance. Because at the end of the day, they will find someone to take your job if you don't get tenure, they'll find someone to do it. If you decide to leave, they'll hire someone else. So your institution, <laughs> wherever you work for, is a place for you to, to get what you need out of it. It is not you. And, it, it, and, and I really want to be very um, tactful in saying that. I really want everyone to hear that. Because when you start aligning your job with your self-worth, it's just going to be unattainable. And that's where people have a uh, dissolving of their relationships, dissolving of their mental and emotional health, physical health. Um, and that's for everyone in this room. Don't let anyone tell you that you are Towson University or you are Whitman or you are, you know, whatever. You aren't. They are their own separate entities. You are yourself and you're bringing something to that institution that makes it better. But if it's at the detriment of your well being, you have to put limitations on that. And paying attention to our mental health, I think as faculty members or as future faculty members is so important because we're increasingly called upon as faculty members to help intervene in the midst of uh, mental health challenges that students face. And as a faculty member, you'll be presented with opportunities to help advocate and intervene on behalf of your students. And I think we're better positioned to do that if we follow Dr. Ball's advice, which is to take care of our own mental health as well. So thanks for very much for that. Um, Dr. Boland, um, I'd like to go to you. Any additional comments on that? And then there were a couple of hands raised that we'll take the last couple of minutes to address. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I am, I am a, a husband to a wife who has a career. I have three school age children um, and I am responsible in part for their care <laughs> as well. So the best advice I received um, for someone entering a tenure track job is live your life pre tenure as you want to post tenure. I think this goes along with what Dr. Ball was saying, right? Know what you want your life to be now. Now you have to jump through some hoops and you'll have to make some trade-offs, but to the extent um, that your life is now <laughs> and you should be living it, I encourage you to adopt that, that frame of mind. Um, I, I, I personally feel like that's my greatest success, honestly, was making it to, to and through tenure, the point where I have tenure and loving my family and them loving me and feeling like I'm a part of it. Um, and it took work and, and it had to be intentional. So I think I'll, I'll stop there since we have time. <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, Jake, you had a question, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here. This has been really fun. And Dr. Ba, I appreciate you uh, normalizing mental health. I had no idea what imposter syndrome was until I started my PhD. And now it's, I can't make a dang omelet without feeling like a failure sometimes. Um, I was curious if y'all had uh, resources for PUIs in particular advertising. So I'm usually on like higher ed job board or there's one particularly for engineering. I was wondering if you have resources where schools like yourselves post opportunities. Any panelists want to speak to that? Chem Jobber, if you're interested in chemistry related jobs, um, they post all types. Uh, you can follow them on Twitter. <laughs> so. They also will tell you the phase that those job searches are in and they have inside information that gets posted there. And Jake, if you wouldn't mind, what, what field are you in? Uh, I'm a hydrologist. I operate under civil and environmental engineering, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a water guy, water and trees. Are, are you familiar with the job listing on AEESP website? Yep. yep, I've got it pulled up right now for sure. Those seem to be, in my experience, in, in that domain, the, the big ones, AWSP, as well as uh, higher ed jobs. Okay. Um, but, but if any of the other panelists had any other insights on that, feel free to jump into. Cool. Appreciate it. Sure. Uh, Mala, I see that you, you have your hand up. Was, was that a residual from a previous question, or did you have another question that you'd like to ask? Oh, yeah. I just forgot to put my hand up. Nope. No problem at all. Well, it is a couple minutes after four, so I would just like to invite all of the participants, if you wouldn't mind, please jump on the chat and extend your thanks to our three panelists for sharing their time and their insights with us. This has been a really, I think, fruitful discussion, things that I wish that I knew 15 years ago when I was thinking about this process, and that was sort of motivated me for organizing this session to sort of share in the, the collective knowledge of, of this community. I hope that um, many, if not all of you, are able to join us tomorrow when we'll have a new panel uh, to discuss strategies for research success at PUIs, same time, same place, tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern. Thank you all very much for being here. That concludes today's session and we look forward to tomorrow's panel discussion on research. Thank you everyone.